Welcome, Chris, and uh, welcome again on the API The Doc stage. Um, today, you're going to talk about very practical things on writing for robots. Um, you're on a stage now as an independent technical communicator, but I think for most of the audience, you're incredibly well known from all the um, different media uh, articles and podcasts and every kind of educational material that you're, um, you're helping people to become better. So thank you very much, and the stage is yours. I am going to touch on bits and pieces of some other talks. Uh, I actually had a bit of a sync up with Emil from Kappa because when I read his description, I thought we have the same talk, but I realized that he's going to zoom out a bit and I'm going to zoom in a bit. So I have a question. I'm going to pose some questions as I go and um, feel free to answer them in the chat as I go and I'll see if I can read any of them as we go through. But I'd like to pose a question. If you have publicly available documentation, documentation that isn't behind a login, isn't closed source, et cetera, et cetera, who do you think is one of the biggest readers of it? Customers, potential customers? Probably not, actually. <laughs> I see competitors. It's probably an even smaller group, actually. But I would argue that for some time, I'm sorry to disappoint you, unless it isn't public, your most frequent reader probably isn't human. Yes, you've all got this. And that's nothing new. Since, I don't know, what is it, the late 90s, I guess early 2000s, since there's been website crawlers venturing out onto the internet to compile websites into portals or into search engine uh, corpuses, services running on machines, which we can call bots if we like, have been reading our work and casting a silent lack of judgment on it for some time. And now we have a new wave of machines guzzling our content to feed and train models. Language models is one of them, large language models is another, but feeding various data sources, we can say. And whatever we may think of this, this old and new wave, unless you disallow it, and there are ways, it's kind of hard to stop some of them. But the good news is, on, before we get into the reasons why you might not want to, but uh, why you might want to, we'll focus on for now. The good news is that actually writing and maintaining good content for humans also produces good content for robots. And this is actually nothing new either. A lot of the content I will go into in kind of the more practical section will probably not be news to most of you, but maybe it's reiterating some of those best practices and potentially, which might be more useful to people here, give reasons to justify to your bosses why you should do it. <laughs> because everyone loves AI right now. So why would you want to do this? Why would you want to let machines read your content? Much like allowing search engines to access your content helped people find what they were looking for. And we could argue that I would say for at least some time, I don't know about any more, but for some time, people often ended up at your documentation through search engines, through external search engines. And it's often, it's marketing, it's how people get got their questions answered, et cetera, et cetera. So it was generally a useful thing to be search engine optimized as possible. And likewise, a lot of the tools we'll be looking at in this event also bring you benefits. And why? Because I think we can all agree that despite many years of discussion and many events, many conference talks, many blog posts, many videos, many uh, hallway conversations, we have never really, as a community, found an ideal way to help people navigate documentation and find what they need. We try to tweak it. We come up with the best headings, we move menus around, we add search, but really all anyone ever wanted was a big old Google style search box to type something into and get an answer from, or talk to somebody. And uh, I think we have sort of finally arrived at a time when that, of course, is possible. Now I'm going to share something. Uh, let me... Okay, so 
some time ago, actually, this was from a Write the Docs event. Oh, I don't know. At least 2018, maybe 2017. Back in the last wave of enthusiasm about chatbots when they really weren't very good and still, for the most part, aren't. This is actually something I shared. Um, I've actually found the image, thankfully. A concept I had come up with called Docsbot. Uh, and I was enthusiastic about all these very bad chatbots at the time and proposed an idea of that instead of people searching, you could talk to the documentation and ask questions and it would remember context and things like that and give you the answers you needed. At the time, people thought this was a crazy idea. <laughs> and uh, because the technology that we could draw analogies to it didn't exist and it just it didn't seem feasible that the chatbots we had at the time could ever do something like this and uh yeah someone's mentioning siri this is even more inferior than something like siri this is basically using big language trees of decisions we've all been in in customer service calls where this happens and you just end up saying let me talk to a human and uh, getting frustrated but yeah i've been so i've been thinking about this for some time basically and now we're kind of at a time where this is possible so it's kind of interesting and now yes we have things that let us do this and so here i'm going to recap some good writing advice much of it that i hopefully you already know which will help machines too and good structure and good content has always helped scrapers in the past and now it helps these new tools. So I'm going to share one other page, actually, before we dump into the tips. People always ask you for places where you think is a good example. I'm actually a big fan of the Next.js documentation. Hopefully this scrolls. I just want to check it's scrolling. Uh, yeah, seems like it. I'm always a fan of the Next.js documentation. Uh, I don't know why exactly. Uh, I like the Getting Started Guide, but this is also a good example of some good structure. Why is it good structure? Because it has plenty of reasonably well thought headings. It has some kind of reasonably best practice like uh, opening things. It always gives uh, context before it leads into something else. There's lots of white space. Everything is nicely identified. It kind of tells you what to expect. It breaks things up into lists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of kind of good practice here, all the way down. It's actually quite a long page, and then we have some kind of next steps too. So, I always sort of refer back to certain sections, especially of the Next.js documentation, as good examples. Okay. All well and good. I think you're probably with me here. Now I will jump into some tips on things you could do. And for many of us who probably see these and think I'm um, following these already, why they will help this new generation of machine scrapers. Okay. Da, da, da. There we are. Yep, yeah, you should be doing these already. <laughs> <laughs> headings some of these seem very obvious to us uh, and i would reiterate here why we have things like active the, the so-called gerund in style headings is often uh these have always been useful but they're more useful because you have to think about the way that people will ask questions as well people ask questions in a way of how do i do this um, so a, a bot will look for answers in a similar form. So the more active we are in our writing, the more likely we are to get responses. The correct hierarchy. I feel like this is something I shouldn't have to explain uh, because, again, many of these rules are not new at all. These have applied ever since web scrapers took to the internet nearly 30 years ago. Uh, this best practice for having like one top-level heading and then level two headings below that, level three headings below those, et cetera, et cetera, in a nice big tree are not new. But a lot of tools that we use break them. Um, so it's, it's useful to know this because some very, very popular tools break these all the time. 
And it's probably one of those areas where many of the scraping tools now used by LLMs can cope, but every little helps. I think this is always the thing with a lot of these sort of tips and bits of advice is every little thing you can do helps. So why not do it? And as good technical writers, we're probably doing a lot of these, but check that the tools you use are. Meaningful links. I'm going to, I can't remember where I heard this anecdote, but I think for, for a lot of uh, time, we've always kind of gone down the best practice that you shouldn't use link text like more and link, read more, et cetera, et cetera. I actually heard a really good anecdote from somebody, um, and I can't remember who, because I'd love to acknowledge them, saying it's equivalent to walking down a street, a shopping street, and just seeing every shop saying shop. Great. I know it's a shop. What's the shop selling? Uh, I find that a very good analogy, actually. And this is very similar. Uh, and you have to especially bear this in mind for machine readers. And this doesn't even relate to, to LLM scraping. This also relates to uh, more old-fashioned machine tools like screen readers and things like that. Uh, often they are read out and just hearing link, 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 link. I mean, imagine hearing that as a person as well. It's incredibly frustrating. You kind of want to know what is the link. So here, generally, we describe what the reader will find or accomplish. And then we can split hairs about exactly what you do next because there's a lot of different opinions, but that's the general principle. Make sure they work. This has always penalized you in SEO. And it's also a big problem for LLMs because if they get led to uh, resources that don't exist, you kind of fall into a black hole. And I actually borrowed this last point from, from Emil, from his talk. Avoid linking to formats that LLMs can't yet process. And I say can't yet because this is moving very, very quickly. And it really depends on the tool chain as well. Alt tags on images. Uh, again, images uh, can, of course, be processed by LLMs, but they're not necessarily always in the same place. And, and some of the discussions that Ellis was covering and other are, people are covering around connecting these tools to other sources of information can, of course, do this. But sort of taking a broad look at some of the more text-based ones, at the moment, they don't directly understand what an image is, and alt tags have always helped. And again, I would argue that tech writing tools especially have always been quite bad at enforcing them. So we should pay special attention to making sure that we fill them out now. And again, they should describe the content of an image. Telling people a screenshot is a screenshot is not massively helpful. Uh, I actually have been forced to use Microsoft Word again, and it generates a lot of alt, automatic alt tags saying screenshot, which is very helpful. <laughs> so, there we go. And then describe other elements. One of the things I showed in that Next.js document is that it always kind of prefixes what is coming next. And again, because whilst a lot of the, the scraping tools can understand what is a table, what is code, et cetera, et cetera. It may not always understand in isolation what it's showing, or it may not be able to process it at all. Again, this comes into things like the videos and the images. This goes in addition to things like alt tags, which to sort of describe it in itself, but the text around also provides that context. A lot of this is all about providing context to the next piece of content. So a tool has highlighted this piece of content, but what does it relate to? How does it relate to? How, what does that mean to the person who's asking the question? What does it all relate to? Context is kind of the, the key thing here. And this is very, very close with code because if you regurgitate a piece of code without really knowing what it relates to, then it, it can help certain people, but it doesn't help everybody, of course. So describing as much as possible. And again, I will reiterate, you're probably doing a lot of this already, but it really justifies this time, spending that time on it more so than in the past. And, um, oh, I already said alt tags. I must have duplicated myself. <laughs> so alt tags, yes, keep them in. I, what is going on here? Okay, that's weird. Oh, I know why. It's because I'm not showing the presentation properly. I'm just looping on myself. So in summary, basically, I think uh, we do definitely have this feeling that what is going to happen to us and our role 
But I would argue for at least the short to medium term, there will still be a lot of demand because what actually feeds all of these models and its content. So I would argue for at least the short to medium term, good quality content will be needed to enable these tools to give you good quality answers. And we really are in the best place to do that at the moment because we do understand the benefits of all of this good structured, good language writing advice. And we've been living and breathing it for a very long time. So we are really the experts to, to, <laughs> to at least be useful in the short to medium term anyway. And uh, thank you very much. Um, as Laura said, I do have a, a lot of things I do. Um, I'm not quite sure where my summary slide went, but you can find more about me at kristenschiller.com. And um, I actually just have a book that came out as well where I lifted some of this content from. So that was uh, intimidating, but exciting. And um, thank you very much. Any questions? There we go. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't see any questions uh, huh? and uh, we have just hit the time limit. Um, so I would recommend maybe in the chat further asking you, or if you can stay uh, further in the day that uh, people find yep. you in the lounge, would you would you be willing to also write down in the chat to the, the reference to your blog and maybe the book where it's available? Yeah, I uh, tried presenting the slides without presenting them and realized that has its limitations. No problem. <laughs> we have, we have a there we go. Thank you very much. Um, one question do come to mind that I mm -hmm. will find you in private, which is, um, is there actually something that would have been good for search engine optimization, but is actually bad when you're writing for AI? Is there, is there like a, hmm. an anti-climatic? <laughs> I mean, uh, okay. Well, we could argue that many of the things we've been forced, well, not necessarily us, but possibly other people around us have been forced to do for search engine optimization, like keyword stuffing and things like that has never been that great for us either and is probably not going to be good for feeding um, the, the next generation of machines either. But I don't know if we're going to be able to stop that. <laughs> so I would argue that, that probably that other side of, of writing for search engines that I kind of largely ignored is something that isn't so good because that is probably my biggest concern is that, um, you know, we end up in this vicious cycle of we already start to see it where machine generated content is feeding the machine generated output and people like us are not being involved and that is probably my biggest concern that we end up in this just vicious loop of nonsense in and nonsense out and we never really solve that problem mm -hmm. uh, and that is probably one area of seo where it has the potential to get even worse if we're not careful because it's already been quite bad for some time which is why we find ourselves in this situation where people are looking for an alternative to search engines. So mm -hmm. thank you very much and see you soon later in the lounge.